abstractly with a finite with a finally generated infinite group, uh, let me call this gamma for the moment. And then we want to try to obtain information on the group on what we call a boundary. Now I have to tell you what a boundary is supposed to mean. So a topological boundary for the group is supposed to be a compact gamma space. A gamma space here is a space on which the group um, acts as a group of homeomorphisms. So we have a topology. So, so Y is a compact. Oops. Um, I don't think I did anything wrong. So let's just try to keep on. Uh, so that there's a compact gamma space such as, the, uh, so there exists a topology. Uh, furthermore, we require that there exists a topology on the union of gamma with Y which restricts to the discrete topology on, on gamma, sorry for this, um, starts already being bad, uh, and is such that gamma, the union of gamma and Y is compact. So gamma is, uh, Y is compact, gamma is a discrete group, which is infinite. So it is by no means compact, but we want that union of gamma and Y is compact. Then the left action of gamma is supposed to extend to the given gamma action on the compact space Y, and the boundary is called small if the right gamma action um, extends to the trivial action on Y. So the group acts by itself by left translation. We require that the left translation extend to the action on Y. Uh, and uh, the right translation, there's another action, of course, by right translation. And we uh, require that the right translation action of gamma on itself extends to the trivial um, action on Y. So now let me give you examples. Uh, the first, these two examples are for some sense, in some sense, non-interesting examples. So we could try to uh, give a one point compactification of the group. So that is not going to re realize anything about the group itself. So we could also try to give a user stone chest compactification of the group. So what is this? So it is a compact space with the following property, and this is characterizes the stone chest compactification. Namely, there exists the map which I call denote by I gamma, which goes from gamma into this compactification, and such that for any compact house of space K and any map F from gamma into K, there exists a unique continuous map, and the, the emphasis, of course, here is on continuous which we call BF, which goes from this uh, stone chest compactification of gamma into K, such that F is the composition of this inclusion of gamma into the stone chest compactification with this map BF. So in other words, this map into a compact space factors through a continuous map from the stone chest compactification into K. So this is a beautiful compactification. However, it's uh, kind of a hard to understand. And for that point of view, it is probably also way too big. So it will be not something that is of any use if you want to study the topology of a group. Now let us look at another example. So we could look at a hyperbolic group in the sense of Gromov, then the Gromov boundary of the group is a compactification. So how was this defined? What is a hyperbolic group? A hyperbolic group is a group with the following properties. There's a Cayley graph, which has a thin triangle property, meaning that if you take th uh, three points in this Cayley graph and you look at the triangle um, that is defined by it, meaning that I take a geodesic in this Cayley graph from A to B, I take a geodesic from B to C, and I take a geodesic from A to C, then there exists a unique number, a delta bigger than zero, such that the delta neighborhood of the geodesic from B to C and the union with the delta neighborhood of the geodesic from A to C contains the geodesic from A to B. Oops, um, there's something wrong. Sorry for this. There's a problem with the mute to Bluetooth. Okay, so yes, back. Sorry for this. Uh, I've experienced technical issues today. I don't know why. So let me call a gamma action on Y to be topological free if for any G in gamma, the fixed point set of G has empty interior. So why are we interested in such a property? We are interested in it because such a property here describes uh, boundaries or will describe boundaries, which in some sense are not too small. The one comp point compactification, of course, does not have this property. 
Uh, and so that is, uh, so topological freeness is a characteristic property for an action which is useful for studying the topology of the group. We call the action minimal if every gamma orbit is dense. That is uh, exactly a property which says that the action or the, this boundary is not too big. So if the boundary is incredibly big, so we can always sort of uh, add some uh, sort of additional uh, space to the boundary, which has no meaning where maybe the gamma action is completely uninteresting, then this boundary will also not tell us anything interesting about the topology of the group. So we want that this, the gamma action is such that every orbit is dense, meaning that this action to the boundary is not going to be too big. And it's called strongly proximal, which is something that is a little bit more abstract, but it's a very useful property. If for any mu probability measure on Y, Y is a compact space, the closure of gamma mu, so we let the group act on this space of probability measures, and this closure is supposed to contain Dirac masses. So any orbit for the action of gamma mu, uh, of gamma on the probability measures by pullback in the usual sense or push forward if you want, um, contains the right masses. Now, uh, let me just make one remark. Uh, so it's, it's what's called C-star simplicity is implied by topological free, strongly proximal actions. So if you have one, you have some uh, operator um, theoretic um, consequences, but uh, we will not be discussing this. So now let me call, uh, recall that uh, something that we have seen already several times before, namely we take the mapping class group, so what is this? We take a surface S of genus uh, at least zero with M big or equals N zero punctures, and we require all with that the complexity is big enough, that means that 3G minus three plus M is big or equal than two, which rules out um, four punctured spheres and one whole tori. And then we look at the mapping class group, the group of isotopic classes of orientation preserving homeomorphisms of S. So since we have discussed this group uh, several times already uh, during this conference, I will not uh, give you uh, any additional information by just recalling the definition here. Uh, so that's a very nice group and we will be interested in this group. So just the usual ordinary mapping class group. Now we try to, obtain a boundary for this mapping class group. And let me point out there's a boundary construction, which is due to Durham, Hagen, and Sisto, um, published in 2017. I have to confess that I do not understand their construction. And I will give you a different construction, which is uh, completely explicit. And we will see what we can. Uh, so again, there's a problem here. Is it possible to join the Zoom meeting with your iPad and that way? Yeah, I guess I have to do this. I'm, I'm really sorry for this. It seems that the Bluetooth is not working here. Um, so, um, sorry for this. Um, let me just stop the screen sharing and uh, just sort of go in with the iPad. Sorry for this. Um, And also, if you need the um, the Zoom link, I've put it in the chat again, so you don't have to dig through your email. Yeah, so it is connecting now. So sorry, I should be um, it's connecting. Okay, so um, um, so now sorry for this. Yeah, I'm really sorry for these technical difficulties. I saw it with the Bluetooth, it's it's working better, but it doesn't. Um, okay, it should be now fine. I hope it's it's now visible. Looks great, thank you. Yes, I, I'm sorry for this. So um, let me let me let me resume what I tried to say. So we look at the. So we look, we try to understand about construct a boundary for the mapping class group. And there was a boundary constructed by Durham, Megan, Hagen, and Sisto, but I will give you a complete explicit construction of a nice boundary. So how do we do this? We start off with um, what Yair was already talking about. We start with a curve graph of the surface. So what is this? The vertices are isotopic classes of simple coarse curves. 
and edges connect curves, which can be realized as jointly. So let me just uh, look at the picture here to and go through it. So here we have one curve, here we have another curve. These guys are connected by <clears throat> an edge simply because they are disjoint. Now we have the, green, the, the brown curve. The brown curve is not disjoint or cannot isotoped in such a way that makes it disjoint from the either the, um, the uh, purple curve nor from the green curve. So this brown curve has essential intersections here with the uh, this curve here and that curve, so they are not um, uh, this, I mean not connected by an edge. So now here's this fantastic theorem of Mason Minsky, meaning that this um, which says that the curve graph is a hyperbolic um, graph and it's uh, the mapping glass group acts on it. The fact that the mapping glass group acts on this graph is completely straightforward because a mapping class group, an element in the mapping glass group, takes an isotopic class of a simple closed curve and maps it to an isotopic class of a simple closed curve, simply because a mapping class group is a group of isotopic classes of orientation preserving homeomorphisms. So that is straightforward. That it preserves disjointly is disjointness is also straightforward. So we get an action of the mapping class group on the curve graph. And Mason Minsky showed that furthermore, this curve graph is a hyperbolic um, graph, meaning that is a it has a thin triangle property, which I alluded to before. Let me scroll up to show it to you. Here, exactly the same thin triangle property holds to you take a, a triangle and it's thin in this sense. So um, why is this good? So they showed even more, namely, if you have an essential subsurface, meaning a subsurface of S, which um, is incompressible in the sense that the fundamental group of the surface embeds into the fundamental group of the big surface, and we also require for the moment that this is connected, then the curve graph of the subsurface is defined and there exists a subsurface projection. And the subsurface projection takes a curve which from the curve graph which uh, intersects this uh, subsurface as zero, not in the empty set, so it means has an essential intersection with S zero and maps it to an element in this curve graph of F zero, F zero, S zero. And this is quasi one Lipschitz for this uh, natural metric where edges are all of length one. And how is this constructed? It's again, a very simple and beautiful um, construction Namely, you take your purple curve, say, um, and look at it, how it intersects S0. So the purple curve does have an inter essential intersection with S0. So what we can just do is we cut S0 out of our surface. And what we then do is we look at how it intersects the surface. So we see a bunch of arcs. The, cur the curve was simple. So we see a bunch of simple arcs. For each of these simple arcs, we can take a neighbor the neighborhood of the arc together with uh, the boundary of the surface. And now we just look at the component of this construction, meaning that what we can now look at is the curve that is given. This, is this one is a boundary component of the neighborhood of the union of this uh, arc with the boundary of um, the surface. So that is one component here of the subsurface projection. There's another one that sits on the other side, looks like this. But you realize these curves are disjoint, so they have no intersection. And this means that uh, this curve that I get, this projection is not well defined in the sense that it does not map a, a simple closed curve to a simple closed curve, but it maps it to curves, a bunch of curves, which in the curve graph have uh, distance uh, at most one. So now the Gormov boundary, uh, we can also talk about the Gormov boundary of this hyperbolic graph. I will not explain what it is, uh, but it's a non-compact separable metrizable space on which the mapping class group X. And I will describe it for you. I will not um, define what the Gormov boundary is, but I will describe what this uh, Gormov boundary is. Namely, it is just a space of minimal filling geodesic laminations equipped with a coarse host of topology. So let me draw a picture. What we do is we take a bunch of curves here, maybe this one, and then we take another one. And so we want to understand when this curve, these set of curves go to infinity in the curve graph. That means we take maybe the red curve as a base point. And we want to understand how curve looks like that is very far away from the given red curve in the curve graph. 
And what we see is with respect to some reference hyperbolic metrics, so that's a, the point here, with respect to, to reference hyperbolic metric, if C is fixed, and if I say C, uh, DJ goes is such that the distance between C and DJ goes to infinity, then what we can do is we can just take this hyperbolic metric, and since all these curves are closed, we can look at the closure of the set DJ, um, DJ the set of accumulation points of the set DJ in the house of topology. So this gives us uh, some subset because the house of topology is compact. So the space of curves of simple closed curves can be compactified in the house of topology. And once we do this, then we see that the, um, the, cl the closures of uh, the simple closed curves consists of what's called a geodesic lamination. And the geodesic lamination is just a closed subset of the surface, which is foliated by simple geodesics. Now let us take the join of topological spaces. Why are we interested in the join? You should think about it. A mapping class group has interesting subgroups. Namely, if you take a surface like this and you cut it into two pieces, then you see the mapping class group on the one piece uh, sitting in the mapping class group of a big surface as a group of isotopic classes of diffeomorphisms, which preserve the other side uh, identically. And you also see the mapping class group of the right hand side sitting in the big mapping class group. So this, uh, however, these mapping classes are that uh, are the identity on the respective sides, they commute. So I can first apply a mapping class of the left-hand side and then do uh, apply a mapping class of the right-hand side or vice versa and you get the same result. So we have a commuting situation here. And if you think about commuting isometries of a cut zero space, then you would think that the boundary of this needs to be the join of the corresponding boundaries of these the subgroups. Now let us look at the join of topological spaces. So what is this? It's just a set of formal sums where I goes from one to K, AI, XI. The numbers AI are contained in the interval zero one. The sum is supposed to be one and the XIs are contained in uh, our space XI. Sorry for this, there's an I missing. Now, if you take a collection of pairwise disjoint subsurfaces, so there may be more than two, maybe K, uh, so the number is bounded from above by um, 2G minus two. But if you do see, take such a collection of pairwise disjoint subsurfaces, then we can just do the following. We define the space, which I ignored by X of, and now it comes the union of these subsurfaces. And this is just the join of the boundaries of these curve graphs of each of these subsurfaces. So that makes perfect sense. And now I form the union of all these spaces over all the collection of subsurfaces. However, this union here is supposed to be a union in the following sense. So I may have here a um, partition of, or say a collection of subsurfaces which are destroyed. I have another collection, which is maybe a different collection of subsurfaces, but which contains maybe the same subsurface. So there may be different collections of uh, disjoint subsurfaces which contain the same subsurface. Then if you look at this definition of join, the, the boundary of the curve graph with fixed subsurface will appear on the join where all the indices here, all, all the coefficients are zero but one, and the one corresponds to the subsurface and this coefficient of the last guy will be one. So we will identify all those objects um, together so that we get uh, just the space here which is just the union of these joints. And um, the main result is the following. So this space is an abstract space. It, the mapping class group clearly acts on it because it acts on subsurfaces. It, it hence it acts on joints of the curve graph of these subsurfaces and also on the boundaries. And this space admits a topology which is invariant under the mapping class group. I call this topology O and it has the following properties. So the space, um, here's an S missing, sorry. The space um, versus topology is compact. 
The action of the mapping glass group is minimal, topological free and strongly proximal. So these are the good properties that we require for the boundary. So the space um, is a small boundary for the mapping glass group. So um, if we, uh, we can attach this boundary um, to the mapping class group in such a way that we do get a small boundary for the mapping class group. Furthermore, if S0 is an essential subsurface of S, then we have an embedding of the um, boundary of S of the mapping class group of S0 into the boundary of the mapping class group of, um, uh, of S. And this is an equivalent embedding. For any pairwise disjoint subsurfaces, S1 to SK, the inclusion, now we had the spaces that we constructed. These spaces were just the joints of the boundary of the curve graph. And we have the, the natural point set inclusion into this, uh, this space H. XS is an embedding. And uh, finally, and uh, the fixed point set of any nielsen just mapping class group, mapping class we uh, learned in the last talk what that is. So that is the obvious fixed point set. So the obvious fixed point set meaning that uh, this uh, element in the um, of, in the mapping class group will act on these uh, corresponding subsurfaces, which are given by the uh, proper the construction in the nielsen thurston classification. And so uh, it is it will be a sort of the action will be trivial on some subsurfaces, and then uh, on this in this boundary. It will, of course, act trivially on the corresponding boundary of the curve graph, and that's basically it. Uh, besides that, the pseudo uh, of mapping class has two fixed points for the action on the boundary of the curve graph. So, let me uh, give you one uh, sort of example. So, if you take a, a for this as last statement, if you take a proper subsurface uh, uh, and you take an element in the mapping class group which is presented by homeomorphism F from the surface to itself with the property that um, the restriction of F to S minus S0 is the identity, as I said before. So the picture is really like this. So maybe this is S0. Here is S for so this right-hand side is S minus S0. And uh, then we, we want that F, um, the restriction of F to S minus S0 is the identity. And the restriction of F to S U is a pseudo loss of element. And then phi is going to act as a loxodromic isometry on the curve graph with pair of fixed points psi minus psi plus in the boundary of this curve graph of S U. And the fixed point Z of phi acting on this boundary here is going to be uh, consisting of the join of, um, uh, of elements in the following form. We take a formal sum of all i, a, i, c, i, where c1 is equal to, uh, say, one of these guys, these fixed points here. And then we want that the support of these uh, lamination theta 2, then may, they may sit in, in some other uh, subsurfaces. So these supports are all uh, contained in s minus s0. So there might be something complicated because we might be uh, able to subdivide the surface on the right hand side into various different components. And so the AI is uh, as usual one between zero and one and the sum is equal to one. Well, that's an explicit description of what this, um, what this element does on this boundary. Now, a nice thing about it is if you look for the analogy of a compactification of the metric space, here you have it, there's a corresponding tits boundary. And this, if you don't know what the tits boundary is, it is completely relevant because I will construct something nice for you, namely this which is oriented curve complex. So now we look at the curve complex and we want things oriented. What does that mean? The vertices, I think about being isotopic classes now of oriented simple closed curves, meaning that I have two copies of a curve in my complex, not just one. Then for any K disjoint oriented simple closed curves, these are vertices of a K minus one simplex. So it's a join of the K vertices in the description that I had before. And um, so what I see here is that any 3G minus three plus M. So that was the, the complexity of the surface of such a tuple here of disjoint simple closed curves defines a 3G minus four plus M sphere in this oriented uh, curve complex. So how does this go? Let us take, um, say, uh, two simple closed curves, which are disjoint. So actually two copies of these simple closed curves. 
in my construction, namely one uh, is decorated with a plus and one is decorated with a minus. So I join C1 plus to C2 plus and also to C2 min to, to minus. And then I join C2 plus to C1 minus. So I get here really a square. And now if I take the join of, um, or this construction here for three simple closed curves, I see a two sphere, why? I started with a square that is constructed from the, um, from the two curves that I started off with, but now I have a copy three uh, of a three three, which comes also with in two copies. Uh, there's a C three plus and a C three minus. And now what I just do is I connect these guys here to each of the, it's hard to draw now, to each of the vertices um, by an, uh, a sort of uh, connects them in such a way that uh, these uh, each of these combinations here form a triangle and then have something on the bottom and I see here two sphere. And if you keep on going, you see here that you really get um, a, a complex which consists of spheres and this complex um, sits in this boundary and sort of the, not topologically embedded, but um, what you get is you get this mod, so the mapping glass group acts on this, on it, you get this mod as sphere complex of dimension 3G minus plus M, so that's the top dimension that you can have. And this admits an uh, equivalent continuous injection into this boundary with dense image. Of course, it is not uh, sort of embedded as a topological embedding because our target space is compact. And this is some sort of a very non-compact space but you get that you get this mod as equivalent continuous injection with dense image. So you can think about it here, have a copy of the TITS boundary if you want as some sort of complex, which is in our case, uh, as it is for the TITS boundary of a symmetric space is made out of spheres. Of course, it's not a spherical building. And now let me finally say that, um, so this has other good properties, um, which I have, do not have enough time to explain now, but there are more um, desired topological properties of a boundary of a group. Namely, here's a short definition and then I stop and then I tell you what I can prove and what I maybe cannot prove. So um, you define an Euclidean retract to be a finite dimensional contractible locally, locally contractible compact topological space. And so if you take the Teichmüller space of the surface, which is a space of finite volume metrics, uh, finite volume hyperbolic metrics on the surface up to the diffeomorphism group, which uh, is either topic to the identity, then um, the, the delta thick part of the Teichmüller space um, is the, the part of metrics with systole that means the length of the shortest closed geodesic is bigger or equal than delta. So that is uh, um, a space on which the mapping class group acts properly and co-compactly. So that is very nice. Uh, and it has a nice, another nice feature, namely it is due to Wolpert and G that, uh, and also G, um, Litz and G, that this space is a mod S equivalent deformation retract of a Teichmüller space. And Teichmüller space is diffeomorphic to R6, G minus six plus two M, hence it's contractible. And this means that this space is contractible, locally contractible. And uh, however, of course, not compact, but it's also a K gamma one for a finite index subgroup, uh, any finite index subgroup um, of the mapping glass group, which is torsion free. So gamma here is torsion free, so gamma is torsion free. Otherwise you don't get a K by one in this way. And now, so we know that this nice space here, the union versus boundary admits a mod S invariant topology such that this union here is compact. So um, it is also nice because the interior has this nice uh, topological property. However, what I do not know is that uh, this, uh, um, the union of this boundary with uh, the, this thick part of Teichmüller space is an Euclidean retract it was a little bit hard to see whether this thing is uh, contractible, but why are we interested in such a construction here? And this is the last thing I want to say, because uh, due to Best Wiener, Best Wiener um, uh, constructed or investigated the notion of what he called a Z structure. And it turns out if you have such a space here, uh, such a compactification, such that uh, say the mapping class group acts on T delta of S properly or compactly, the, uh, this, uh, the union is an Euclidean retract and you have some additional properties on the boundary, then you get complete homological information. 
from uh, the action of the boundary, that means from the commodity or the properties, topological properties of the boundary um, for the mapping to, uh, to say from the topology of the boundary, you get uh, information on the commodity of the mapping class group. However, this at this point, uh, this is a little bit of speculation because again, I do not know whether this thing is, it has all the other nice properties, but I do not think whether, I do not know whether this thing is actually um, contractible. So that is all what I wanted to say. And thank you very much for your attention. Let's thank Ursula.